Hi, I'm Susanna Bowling, and this is T2C Online. And what we want to tell you today is that it is the 50th anniversary of the Broadway Women's Professional League. And today we are with the cast of Streetcar Named Desire, most of whom are women-based. So this is a whole new series of women in theater. And I'm going to let the cast and the producer and the director introduce themselves. My name is Aaliyah Jones. I am one of the two lead producers on A Streetcar Named Desire that opens at the Broadhurst on April 22nd, preview starting April 3rd. Hi, I'm Emily Mann. I'm the director of A Streetcar Named Desire, which opens at the Broadhurst on the 22nd of April and starts previews on April 3rd. I'm Daphne Rubin Vega. I play Stella in A Streetcar Named Desire. Hi, I'm Nicole Ari Parker. I'm playing the role of Blanche in The Streetcar Named Desire. The things that we've heard from um, actors of color uh, is that they study these roles. They study um, all of the great American classics and have um, studied them thinking that they would never have the opportunity to do them uh, professionally, to actually you know, perform um, on a professional stage. or. Um, on a first class stage, on a Broadway stage, uh, in these roles. And so, you know, the roles of Stella and Blanche might not have been available um, for actors of color in the past, and that's one of our mandates as producers. Taking to what Aaliyah said, it's like I, don't, I didn't graduate uh, NYU with a, with a black agenda, you mm -hmm. know? I graduated, like, fully experiencing the Tisch program, and my parents sacrificed thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, to make sure I knew how to, you know, interpret Shakespeare and Tennessee Williams, just like my non-black counterpart. You know, everyone that graduated from that class, um, we're all equally prepared, but here I am 20 years later. Thank you, Aaliyah. Yeah. 20 years later, you know, um, getting an opportunity like this. Well, how does it feel to play Blanche? How does it feel to play Blanche? Well, I think <laughs> it's one of the best roles ever written for, for a woman, for an actress. Um, Tennessee Williams is one of the greatest American playwrights to have ever lived and he he demands everything from the actress that plays these two sisters. They, their, their intuition, their passion, the depth of their soul, not to mention just their stamina and intellect and um, and so I feel completely maximized <laughs> as an actress and it's very fulfilling. Of all the qualities that you can bring to the role, what do you think are the most important? I think that I I think I bring an openness um, and a little little sad. This has been really amazing. You know, the attention to detail, Emily's really take, putting us through our paces. Um, and it's a wonderful experience because we get to really um, uncover, you know, what, what is so on the page and, and not on the page. You know, we get to really um, roll up our sleeves and, and explore in great detail the possibilities of what this is. This is, for me, um, uh, Blanche's play. It isn't for everyone, which is interesting, and that's another topic, but I think for Tennessee it was Blanche's play. And it was a play about the sisters, the foundation, and that's how we started. They came to uh, visit me in Princeton. We had our own little workshop. We also went out to New Orleans together, the three of us, and did a oh, lot nice. of our own uh, research together. That the Dubois family and the Dubois sisters have a very strong um, bringing up. And if you look at New Orleans culture, you'll see that as as Dubois, they are um, descendants of free people of color who were the French Huguenots with you know um, uh, the African people who were uh, brought to this country against their will. And um, when you look at that culture, the quadroon balls, the octoroon balls, that, that the different plantations sometimes were not just um, run by free people of color, but they were also um, 
a place where a certain society grew up. So these young women were brought up um, to know how to dance and how to curtsy and how to give a man their hand. And Stella's the rebel. She said, no, I don't want that. And Blanche tried to hold it all together, tried to save all of that and live that dream. It's interesting to me that Tennessee wrote this play in the French Quarter, living in a house owned by a free woman of color, descendant of a free woman of color. Oh. It was in his, in his consciousness, just as you hear the music, just as you hear the street vendor cries. He knew all about that, and it saturates this play. So for me, he always said he wanted to see people of color do this play, and he never really lived to see it, and he wanted it to be done on Broadway, I think in the early 50s, and then there was, it didn't quite come together. But he kept giving permission to other groups to do it, and you know, universities and regional theaters and all of that, but never saw it in a production like this. I think he'd be so happy, because once you make, and he gave permission to make little tweaks to those companies that did it, because there are little things like you wouldn't go to Galatoire's in late 40s, early 50s as, as people of color, it was segregated. So where did you go? Well, there was this great Creole restaurant called Dookie Chase, and that's what we're using. So I think the authenticity of it also brings it alive in a new way so that it helps dispel the ghosts that, you know, are iconic in the American DNA. So looking at it fresh, with this cast, suddenly it comes alive in a whole new way, and you hear the music of it and say, oh my god, these people were black. Oh my god, <laughs> this is African-American speech to the nth degree. So we're having you know, a thrilling time excavating. I was the first person to direct, first woman to direct on the Guthrie main stage in Minneapolis in the late 70s, and it was The Glass Menagerie. Tennessee's brother, Dakin, came to see it and said it was his favorite production, including the original. So he called Tennessee, and Tennessee called me and said, would you like to direct my last play? So that's how I met, he didn't say last play, he latest. didn't know it was his last play, his <laughs> latest play. It had to be his last play, unfortunately. So he and I became very close. Um, was it The Masks? No, it was called A House Not Meant to Stand interesting title mm. to be the last mm. and so many of the pieces in it were, were stunning of course because mm. it's Tennessee but I was very young and it wasn't quite ready and I didn't know how to help him so I actually didn't um, end up directing it I just told him I, I didn't know how um, he, he said oh Miss Emily this is meant for you it's like oh god till about 30 till about just a few months ago I still held on to this pain in my heart because right. he died a few years later but um, he always told me that I understood him I understood his mother and we had a talk about streetcar I said that's my favorite play and that someday I want to direct it and I knew I wasn't ready <laughs> then. Um, and um, I said but one thing bothers me in college I went to see the um, the movie of it with a whole bunch of you know college students during reading period and the guys in the house were all cheering Stanley and laughing at Blanche and I said I've never read the play that way and it's so painful to me and he said it's so painful to him and that the balance was off it shouldn't be what happens mm -hmm. if you truly truly embrace the play and he thought maybe because Marlon Brando was so fantastic and so new and alive and real and as he said you know Vivian Lee was cooler and and more classical um, that you know for non you know Americans hate people who are elitist in any way or think they're better in any way and that there seems to be a kind of less than authentic feel to them that that perhaps is why it happened but he hopes that someday that won't happen with this play so doing it in this way suddenly all that behavior goes. Because if you are a woman of color who's had Blanche's experiences, you have a survivor at the core. The template that was laid down by other actresses on this play early, you know, in the premiere, right. um, it became a, a kind of victim. victim. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we're not see, seeing it that way, of course. She's I don't victimized think... as, yes. as her sister, but she's not a victim. Mm -hmm. and. And I, and I often say that about the, the casting of color is that it, you know, we're talking a lot about changing and how's it going to change and how's it going to change. And like Emily said, it's only going to illuminate the material. Like, she's a Tennessee Williams purist. You know, the, 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 the Tennessee Williams fanatics are not going to be disappointed that we've, you know, diluted and manipulated his material. Like, it's completely intact. 
and um, and and um, but I think that there's something about African Americans or people of color in this country that lends itself to translating Tennessee Williams characters because Tennessee Williams loved characters who in, who endured, who yes. survived, mm -hmm. who pushed through like like the little blade of grass in the concrete, mm -hmm. even with their the frailty. Yes, and he talked violence. about that. He often said, you know, these women, you know, they may be butterflies on the outside, but they're iron butterflies mm -hmm. or they're steel butterflies inside that core so strong. And so we're taking that cue and of course that that has been Nicole's instinct on the role from the get-go.